Colorado's Lauren Boebert is at the center of attention, holding up the selection of a House Speaker for the first time in a century. And so now here we are being sworn at instead of being sworn in. A conservative leader in Colorado talks about coming political violence, saying it's almost time to switch from ballots to bullets. Colorado acknowledges sending migrants to New York City, saying most of the migrants who have come here don't plan to stay in the state long term. A new national mass shooting victims fund hopes to provide long term help when lives are shattered. And a church makes a donation to wipe out more than a million dollars in medical debt. That's next. Congress's work is at a standstill tonight. And Colorado's Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert can claim some of the credit for that. She's only been in the House majority for a few hours now, and she's already making an impact working with a small group of far-right Republicans to hold up the election of a new House Speaker. This hasn't happened in 100 years. So after three rounds of failed voting today, the House is adjourned until tomorrow. They can't do any other work until they pick a Speaker. 20 Republicans are opposing California's Kevin McCarthy for Speaker. It's enough to prevent him from Jeff, winning the job. Boebert helped lead the opposition on this. CNN and the New York Times report that in a GOP meeting, Boebert loudly heckled McCarthy, much as she heckled President Biden during an address to Congress, yelling BS, well, full word, at McCarthy as he spoke. Boebert's spokesperson told us she mumbled BS. She didn't yell it. She told reporters she's working for unity. I have been working every day to unify the Republican Party for the American people. And yesterday, we had a deal that was not a selfish deal in any way for Kevin McCarthy to get him the gavel on the first ballot, and he eagerly dismissed us. We asked Boebert's team how her actions and outbursts square with her pledge after her narrow reelection to, quote, bring the temperature down. They did not answer. A Republican activist in Colorado is saying, quote, it's almost time to switch from ballots to bullets. That open talk of political violence comes from a convicted felon, now GOP organizer, who's best known for the reality TV show that featured his gun shop, Gunsmoke, in Wheat Ridge. Hi, I'm Rich Wyatt. Welcome to Gunsmoke Guns TV. Rich Wyatt is the well-known gun guy. Well, he used to be. He had a show on Discovery. Then he was sentenced to federal prison for conspiracy to sell guns without a license and tax fraud. Yes, I'm a felon. No, I can't have any guns, ammunition, none of that. Wyatt is out of prison now and back involved in Colorado's Republican politics. He leads the Mountain Republicans in Jeffco. That's him addressing a recent rally. And this is him on a podcast last week warning that political violence may be coming. It's almost time to switch from ballots to bullets because that's what wins the hearts and minds. And there's no arguing with a bullet. You can argue about ballots, but you cannot argue with bullets. Reached by phone, Wyatt declined to say who would be targeted by that political violence and whether he plans to participate. As a convicted felon, he's not legally allowed to have weapons. Wyatt wouldn't answer questions, but said he wanted to come on next to talk about it. The bottom line is our Constitution is crystal clear that if we ask for a redress to fix the problems of the government, not dealing with us squarely or fairly like the British did, then we are to attack and to defend our country and constitution at all costs. Wyatt made his comments about political violence on the Chuck and Julie Show podcast. You might remember it from talk radio. It was canceled from 710K in U.S. back in 2019 when co-host Chuck Bonnewell said he wished for a quote-unquote nice school shooting to break up coverage of the Trump impeachment hearings. Both Wyatt and Bonnewell are involved in that effort to install a far-right leader as the head of the Colorado GOP. There will be party elections in March. Democratic Governor Jared Polis says the state is helping Denver address the influx of migrants coming here by helping to pay for some migrants' trips elsewhere if Colorado's not their final destination. This is something that cities and states have been doing across the country. New York City Mayor Eric Adams discussed that this morning while echoing Colorado's calls for more federal assistance. Now, we were notified... Uh, said we were notified yesterday that the governor of Colorado is now stating that they are going to be sending migrants to places like New York and Chicago. Uh, this is just unfair uh, for local governments to have to take on this national obligation. Governor Polis has said that Colorado is helping migrants get to their requested destinations, like New York, for weeks now, but said that the recent weather, uh, winter storms and some more arrivals from the southern border prompted him to warn New York City they could see more people than usual. Polis says the state is only coordinating transportation for migrants who want to leave Colorado, and the governor's office estimated that 70% of the 3,500 migrants who have arrived 
don't plan to stay here. Denver's emergency managers have said the city shelters are full and resources are at a breaking point. I really can't imagine what might happen without that um, getting that critical help that we need from the state and the federal government. The city isn't able, simply not able, to provide um, the resources and the infrastructure to maintain the level of sheltering and support that we have been providing over the last month and a half. Denver and the state have not said how many migrants are being bused to other places and where specifically. Mayor Michael Hancock's office has said that he's talked to the mayors around the country and together they're calling on the Biden administration to provide more federal support to manage the situation. A group of people that sadly know well the long-term impact of mass shootings is trying to come up with a new approach to helping victims even years after one of these tragedies. And today they talked with our Steve Steger to outline what they're thinking about. Steve? And Kyle, this group, victims first, born out of the Aurora Theater shooting. Since then, they've been harshly critical of nonprofits raising funds after a shooting, arguing that they should directly distribute to victims rather than giving to a service provider and other nonprofits. To that end, they have rebranded their Victims Fund, now calling it the National Mass Shooting Victims Fund. It's a pool of money available to anyone who is a victim of a mass shooting for anything they might need. Victims First President Anita Bush, who lost her cousin Michaela Medic in the theater shooting, told me this fund will honor the donor's intent. So if a donor says they want to support victims of a specific shooting, that money will go to those victims. The thought behind this is victims constantly have needs, often struggle to fund those needs with the cash to pay for them. It could be an immediate or long-term need, and Bush says that they decided to rename the fund to include the term mass shootings because that violence just doesn't seem to stop. It's shocking the amount. We, we, we can barely keep up at times um, just to keep helping, but we'll, you know, we promise to be there and keep helping as long as people need help. For Club Q victims, it's been uh, rental assistance. We helped uh, for accessibility needs. We helped um, rip out a carpet and install hard, hard flooring, you know, um, for so that they could use it with a walker um, in their apartment. Um, we we um, help with food, utilities. Victims first, vets who they're giving donations to. People have to provide some sort of proof that they were involved in a mass tragedy. This is a fun for any mass casualty event, though, not specifically a shooting. But it is a sad sign of the times that it decided to use that term in the name of the fund just because this keeps happening over and over again, Kyle. Yeah, how horrific that this keeps happening and that it falls to survivors and victims' families to do the organizing about how to do this better. And, and we still have the issue that uh, when a tragedy happens, society often turns away within, what, 48, 72 hours a week? So the, the window to capture people's attention and their generosity is often very short. It's so small. And the, uh, these groups say that they, they try very hard to get a fund stood up very quickly. Uh, Victims First does set up a fund, uh, but they, and they have kind of a different direction that they want to take with the money that they raise. Uh, but it's such a difficult window, that short span of time when folks are really, really looking to help. People are so generous, but really the attention's on it for about 48 hours, maybe yeah. even a week. Steve, thank you. Yep. When the worst happens to an athlete during competition, like what we saw last night during the Monday Night Football game, you want that life-saving speed of medical care that was administered to Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin when his heart stopped after a hit. Hamlin's still in critical condition tonight. Colorado's high school athletes, they don't have access to NFL-level medical care on a moment's notice. In fact, our Marshall Zellinger found out there might not even be an athletic trainer on duty. Last night highlighted the need for athletic trainers in schools. Michael Kruger is the commissioner for CHASA, the Colorado High School Activities Association, which requires this emergency action plan to be submitted for every venue that hosts a practice or athletic event. Where an automatic external defibrillator is located, um, who, uh, who is uh, in charge of the situation, how are we going to get an ambulance in. One emergency action plan cannot cover multiple facilities, and you know we have gymnasiums and fields and courts and pools. An emergency action plan like that was used one year ago tomorrow when a basketball referee collapsed at Bear Creek High School when his pacemaker battery died. The certified athletic trainer, Ashley Cowan, was at his side in nine seconds and got an automatic external defibrillator, an AED, to shock the ref, 
who survived. Certified trainers like Cowan are not required in high school sports. They are highly trained to handle these type of situations and we just don't have the funding in a lot of areas to have certified athletic trainers in schools. I think that anyone that you talk to would say they would prefer if there was a certified athletic trainer on site to provide care during high school athletic events. Jeb Davis is the president of the Colorado Athletic Trainers Association. He told me when a certified athletic trainer is not on site, that does not mean there is no care. The care and prevention and the initial um, triage and treatment falls to usually the coaching staffs, coaching staffs and high school administration. CHASA requires coaches to have training in CPR, AEDs, and first aid. Having a certified athletic trainer would be a cost school districts would have to fund. My ask would be this, it would just be that administration, respective of costs, seriously consider employing a certified athletic trainer. I don't think there's any reason that NFL athletes should be treated differently than, say, someone at a freshman cheer event. Davis tells me the larger the school district or school, likelier to have a certified athletic trainer. They can also double as teachers. However, some are just hired for athletic events, but no matter how they're employed, they need to be paid, and that's from the school district funds, and this is the same money that goes to pay teachers, yeah. utilities, supplies, so fighting over the same money that anybody else in a school district might fight over. So what we saw happen to DeMar Hamlin last night was the first time that a lot of people have seen that happen in an athletic event. It's happened a couple of other times. The idea of somebody needing CPR or an AED that's a far more likely occurrence. Right, and you saw that one example from a year ago tomorrow at Bear Creek. I've heard um, there's an example at Platte Canyon of, a, of another basketball ref where the athletic trainer saved their life with an AED. At Liberty High School in Colorado Springs, a freshman on the football field went down. Between the nurse and the athletic trainer, they used an AED, got the kid revived, survived, and, and, and I, I understand him playing other sports, not football right yeah. now, but is back in school a year later. And all of it just speaks to the importance of people being CPR trained, defibrillator trained, to be able to help anybody within proximity. Marshall, thank you. An expensive lesson for a hospital in the mountains. If you're going to buy equipment, make sure it works at altitude. And a church on a mission to eradicate poverty however they can. How can we um, help to really change lives? We're starting by buying up some old medical debt. Next. St. Vincent Health in Leadville is taking a taxpayer bailout to stay afloat. And part of the deal to get the cash from county commissioners in order to make payroll is that the hospital is going to get more financial scrutiny. And oh boy, there are some doozies that are being discovered there, like the $170,000 that St. Vincent spent on equipment that is not guaranteed to work at high altitude. This is Leadville. Because they're above 10,000 feet, the hospital's interim CEO says they have new equipment that cannot be certified to work. The hospital CEO says they stopped using the equipment once they realized it might not work properly, and they're trying to get their money back. Commissioners also want the hospital to pay back the up to $480,000 that it got as a bailout to make payroll. Also part of this deal, the hospital had to apologize to Lake County taxpayers and to their staff. We had a kind of cloudy and cool day today, but we've got some more sunshine in the days ahead. Cloudy and cool for us tonight with temperatures about seasonal levels, maybe a little bit warmer than average. And then mountain snow continues for us overnight, but it's generally lighter snow compared to what we've seen. And then temperatures are going to gradually warm on up as the week wears on. HD Doppler radar showing us some of that snow mainly across the western slope. Most of what we're seeing in the mountains now, enough snow to perhaps slicken up the roadways, but those accumulations maybe another inch or two overnight. And then we'll be done with the snow for the most part by tomorrow morning. Maybe a lingering flurry for a few spots here into the high terrain. And we will wake up to sunshine here into the Denver area after a pretty cloudy day for our day today. Temperatures tonight dropping down about 15 degrees, mostly cloudy skies, but we're already starting to see those clouds break out up for us, and we'll see those clouds continue to break up as we head through the overnight hours. That'll lead to more sunshine as we wake up tomorrow morning with a high temperature getting up to about 38 degrees, still cooler than our seasonal average in the low to mid 40s, but a bit more sunshine should at least melt off some of that snowfall and make it feel a little bit better than what we've seen. Now, as we head through the week, we're going to be talking about a gradual warm up thanks to an area high pressure that moves on in. That means those temperatures finally getting back into the 40s. In fact, those mid 40s by the weekend may make it feel maybe not quite like Maui, but certainly a lot better than those 20s and 30s that we've seen over the last few days. 
it's a relatively small donation with an outsized impact. We already see the positive ripple effect of our contribution. How a church donation $5,000 wiped out more than a million dollars in medical debt. Next. For months, parishioners at the First Presbyterian Church of Fort Collins have been brainstorming ways that they could eradicate poverty and address discrimination. Presbyterian churches across America are working on this Matthew 25 initiative, and each congregation decides on their own local approach. So they got an idea from a church member named Craig Antico, one of the co-founders of a group called RIP Medical Debt, which purchases and pays off medical debt for people who are living below the federal poverty level. Church leaders decided, you know, that would be the perfect use for some of the money they'd set aside for this poverty initiative. So they took $5,000 and they purchased and retired more than $1 million of medical debt just in time for the holidays. Even when um, debt is bundled and purchased by various collection agencies, the debt still lingers on the record of the person who incurred that debt. So it's like... A, it's like a millstone around their neck yet. And it can be... Um, uh a huge distress in their lives, um, trying to get over a medical debt uh, in order to get back on track, um, making yeah. ends meet, feeding their family, providing a house, etc. So the church comes in, grabs that debt at pennies on the dollar, and poof, there it goes. The church says approximately half the retired debt was held by families in their area, Larimer, Weld, and Boulder counties, and the rest was for families elsewhere in Colorado. The average debt retired was $982. Faith in action right there. Feedback spicy tonight. That's next. Now, Colorado's got lots of opinions on how to drive in the snow, but I think we can all agree this ain't it, Chief. Steamboat Radio shared this photo of a driver who had some trouble on a trip to the store. Apparently, the driver mistook some snow covered stairs for a hill, and away we go. Look closely there. We might have blurred them out. I think those were Texas plates, but you know, hey, that's neither here nor there. A uh, lot of feedback tonight on Republican activist Rich Wyatt's latest claim about political violence, saying, quote, it's almost time to switch from ballots to bullets. John Jackson says, I'm a gun owner. I've litigated successfully gun rights cases on behalf of gun owners. And John says, I'm totally appalled and disgusted by this behavior. People like this are the biggest threat to the Second Amendment. Rhonda asks a good question. Why are you providing airtime to people who are advocating violence? I'm sure Mr. Wyatt would say he was just chatting, not advocating violence. But I would say this. When somebody in a position of political power in our state talks about the idea of supplanting the democratic process for killing people, the public should know about that. Everybody should know about that. Want to talk about something lighter? Shirley writes in to say, new jacket. I like it. It's not new, Shirley. Do you know the tradition here? We write, write on the little card here. It was last worn on October 7th of 2021. That's why you think it's new. It's because I didn't bring it out last year. I don't know. It's a little loud. I'm thinking about getting rid of this one. Feedback's welcome on that as well. See you next time. Mm -hmm.